Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> Couple of quick announcements. First is I did upload an MP3 of the last lecture, just the audio. I'll do that for all the rest of them. They'll all be on D2L. Second thing, of course, is the exam week from today. Uh, once you get here and actually get started, uh, you can have as long as you like. But once the first person finishes the exam, then no one's going to be allowed to start it because I let you take the exams with you. Um, you need Scantrons. It's all going to be multiple choice. I'm sorry with so many of you and no graders and none of them in sight. Um, that's the only way I can do this class. Um, any questions on the exam at this point? Yeah. Yes. Yes, so fortunately for you, probably, I guess some of you are probably really good drawers, uh, the question is, will there be a base pair? You need to draw a base pair on the exam. I used to do that until I used to spend about a week trying to grade all of those. Um, and there are more and more of you every time. Okay, <clears throat> let's see what you thought. Uh, most people, well, not quite most, but at least the <clears throat> main number of people saying super.
you have more regulation and you can have more regulation in a system where you have multiple different transcripts because that allows you to regulate the individual RNAs for the individual proteins separately. And so that's a reason why you want to have multiple different transcripts. Um, more efficient, again, that's probably why you want to have the individual transcripts. Um, and allowing more combination and more protein made. Um, in theory, you can potentially make more of the proteins all together, but because you've got the different regulation, you can certainly do more of that if you've got multiple different transcripts. And splicing is, in fact, somebody asked me about this in office hours. Splicing does happen in bacteria and archaea, but it's much less frequent than you have in eukaryotic systems. So our next question, <clears throat> from a single strand of RNA, in theory, X number of different amino acid sequences can be encoded and just one through five. Okay, what do we think? <clears throat> Looks like most people think three, some one, and some some of the others. Uh, so the, this question is really about reading frames and how many different reading frames you can have in the genetic code. And the answer to the number of different reading frames is three. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case, just looking at the RNA. If you think about double-stranded DNA, on the other hand, a double-stranded piece of DNA can have two different strands, template strand either on the top or on the bottom. So in that case, you could have six because each of those reading frames on each strand is going to be different relative to each other. So here, it just depends on whether you start. You start at nucleotide one, you start at nucleotide two or nucleotide three, and each of those is going to give you a different sequence. Now, why did I put in theory on here? Um, that's because in most cases, you only have one. Now, again, there are exceptions, but for the most part, you only have one. So, but with the three different possible open reading frames, and that's going to lead into what we're going to talk about for the rest of today, which is mostly translation. So how do you get translation in one and generally only one reading frame? And it turns out that one ribosome again, with a couple of exceptions, is generally going to start in one reading frame and it's going to stay in that reading frame through the rest of the process. Okay, so <clears throat> last time again we talked about supercoiling, which we just discussed with the clicker questions, thought a little bit about the topoisomerases, and again, the critical aspect of topoisomerases is the type 1 topoisomerases are going to cut one strand, which is going to change what in terms of DNA? Twist. And the topoisomerase 2s are going to change rise because they're cutting double strands and passing them through. Now, the interchangeable nature of DNA means, or the twist and rise, means that once you've changed one, it can also change the other. And so, yes, the topoisomerase 2, its actual activity is going to change rye, but the overall change could be in twist, just as much as it could be in rye. 
Looked a little bit at RNA structure. Uh, this is a great introduction to the ribosome. I'm just going to be talking about again for the most of the rest of today because the secondary and tertiary structures you have in the ribosome are all about these extra RNA structures that you actually have. Um, we'll look a little bit at RNA's processing. This will mostly be towards the end of the class, um, right before the final, which does remind me, I'm actually going to be out for four lectures right at the end, and I will have replacement instructors for those. Um, most of those are probably going to be done by Dr. Bartlett, who um, some of you may have had in Principles of Biology. Um, talk a little bit about transcription, and again, we'll get back to transcription later on, but the important aspects about transcriptions are the promoter, template, and where you have your plus one upstream and downstream thereof. And so those are the important aspects for now. Again, we'll get back much more transcription later on. Then for translation, we sort of looked very briefly at the overall mechanisms. Now we're going to talk about some of the more detailed aspects of translation today. Start out talking about the ribosome, probably the most amazing molecular machine, and certainly the most amazing RNA-based molecular machine, RNA enzyme, also known as a ribozyme, that we know of. Uh, then we'll talk about initiation. There are really three steps in terms of pretty much all molecular biological processes, initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, so we'll start out talking about that for translation. We'll do the same for transcription and the same for replication. Um, we'll talk a little bit in terms of initiation about the differences between bacterial and eukaryotic initiation. And a lot of that has to do with the polycystronic versus monocystronic transcripts. You know, how you're actually getting that translation to take place. And then a lot of the processing that you have in eukaryotic messenger RNAs that you don't have in bacterial RNAs. Look a little bit about at these really fascinating sequences. Most people call them irises, but they're internal ribosome entry sites, and that really just tells you exactly what they are. You know, it means that your ribosome can start in the middle of a messenger RNA as opposed to starting at the end, the five prime end of your messenger RNA. Um, look a little bit at elongation and termination. What does the job of making proteins? I like to think of the ribosome as an amino acid polymerase. People talk about DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases. So you can think of the ribosome as just an amino acid polymerase. What does the job? It's lots of RNAs coming together. These RNAs are confusingly named by their relative sedimentation coefficient, which is this S for Svedberg, from a wonderful Swedish scientist who basically invented the ultracentrifuge. I was cursing him a little earlier when our ultracentrifuge wasn't working. Uh, but <clears throat> you have basically one called large ribosomal RNA, one small ribosomal RNA. In the case of bacteria, these are 23S and 16S. In the case of eukaryotes, they're 28S and 18S. Eukaryotes, a little variation between the different ones. That's why it says vertebrates on this particular slide. 23S and 16S come together with 5S and 16S to make 70S. And it gives, gives you a really nice idea that you know, the math here doesn't work because if you add 23, 16, and 5, you certainly don't get the 70. Um, the large subunit of the ribosome in bacteria is 50S, the small one is 30S. And again, the basic message here is you've got larger ones and smaller ones, and that's all determined from sedimentation coefficients as we talked about back when we talked about centrifugation later on. So it's how quickly these things move through density gradients in the sedimentation process. And so these guys here, the reason that it's you know, 50 plus 30 equals 70 is it's more compact. And since it's now more compact, it's going to be going through that density gradient a little bit faster. The, basically the same thing is true for eukaryotic ribosomes. It is for bacterial ribosomes. These sequences, the 28S versus the 23S, are actually extremely similar to each other. 
with just a couple of extra pieces that have been inserted into the eukaryotic ribosome. The activities of these things are basically identical to each other. They're just amino acid polymerases, and they use tRNAs and messenger RNAs as substrates making the amino acids. So in terms of their actual functions, and then not terribly surprisingly their structures, are extremely similar relative to each other. There are a bunch of proteins that are involved. It's not critical, again, any of these numbers. Uh, most of these proteins in both eukaryotic, bacterial, large subunits, small subunits, are basically involved in holding the structure together, keeping the RNA in the right form. So let's look at that RNA, because again, it's really all about the RNA as far as ribosomes are concerned. Here in the middle is an image of a bacterial large subunit um, RNA. In fact, the structure was really from an archaea, but people ignore that most of the time. Um, this is all RNA with the exception of this small piece over here. This is the L1 protein. That's the large ribosomal protein number one. Um, and the only reason they include it here is to make a nice symmetrical structure. So you have sort of, you know, sort of a hand or a three-fingered hand with three all together here and then these things the outside. Give you an idea where the tRNAs sit in this structure. They're shown here in color on the right-hand side. This is now red, sort of brownish, and yellow. Um, almost never have three tRNAs bound at the same time. Um, we'll see where that's happening a little bit later on. But it's all about the RNA. Uh, we kind of knew this already because people had purified almost all of the proteins away from the ribosomal preparations, and they still worked, still worked in terms of making amino acid polypeptide chains. But when they finally solved the structure, and again, this is the structure of an archaeal large subunit, all of the yellow things here are the proteins. The gray is the RNA. Proteins are all on the outside. And all of the action, as you saw where those tRNAs were bound, is in the inside, right in the middle of this structure. And it turns out the active site where you get peptide bond formation is right here in the middle. And it's far too far away from any of the amino acid side chains to actually have then that is be the active site in terms of the enzyme. And we know quite a bit about that structure now. Um, these structures have actually only really come out in about the last 10 years that we now have high resolution structures of the ribosome. What's the ribosome doing? Polymerizing amino acids. How does it do that? Well, it starts, it continues, and it stops. So initiation, elongation, and termination. This is the case for <clears throat> the bacterial system. We'll talk about the differences with the eukaryotic system in just a second. You have the small ribosomal subunit, which will associate with a very specific tRNA. This tRNA carries what amino acid? Methionine. But it turns out it's a different tRNA than the tRNA that you use to put methionine into the middle of proteins. So there's a specific initiator tRNA. This is, in fact, the initiator tRNA that contains methionine, and the sequence and the modifications that happen on that tRNA are different relative to the elongation uh, methionyl tRNA. Once you have the initiator tRNA bound to the start codon, the AUG, then you have the large ribosomal subunit that associates, and we'll see later that's really a, sort of the two clamshells that come together. You've got the large subunit, the small subunit. Those tRNAs are really right smack dab in the middle, together with the messenger RNA. And then you have your new amino acid tRNAs that come in. You have peptide bond formation. This continues. This is your elongation step until you get to the stop, which is here in red. And then the whole thing dissociates, starts over, and goes through the process again. So this is a very, very general case. Now let's look at some more of the specifics. If you look at bacterial RNAs, you remember these are the polycystronic RNAs, 
We've got often multiple proteins that are encoded in one RNA. These are made into proteins actually as the messenger RNA is being made by the RNA polymerase. It's what's called coupled transcription and translation. So as you're making the messenger RNA, you're translating it at exactly the same time. Here you've got <clears throat> those ribosomes, again, small subunit together with the large subunit come together, will translate along this messenger RNA, then they'll dissociate and reassociate at the next start codon for your next polypeptide, go along, continue through this, and then at the end of almost all bacterial messenger RNAs, there's this stem loop structure in the RNA, which we talked about before, base pairing with a loop in between, and that causes <coughs> your first termination of transcription, and then also seems to help a little bit with the termination of translation. But this is much more important for your transcriptional termination. On the other hand, with you've got your eukaryotic messenger RNAs down at the bottom here, these guys are all the ones that have caps put on them, they have poly A tails put on them, they have splicing that takes place, but probably most importantly, all of this happens in the nucleus where there's no translation going on. So all of that modification happens, that messenger RNA is transported out of the nucleus, and then you have translation taking place. Now, that translation takes place through lots of interactions with those modifications that happen on your messenger RNA. You have proteins that bind to the cap structure. You have proteins that bind to the poly A tail. But once that's happened, then you have the large subunit and the small subunit coming together and your <coughs> ribosomes making protein. Getting down to the end, dissociating, and et cetera. So we talked about reading frames before in that clicker question. How does the ribosome know actually where to start? Bacteria, it's easy, and that's because almost all bacterial messenger RNAs have a sequence at their 5' prime end, which is complementary to a sequence which is in the small subunit RNA sequence in the ribosome. And so basically it's a base pairing interaction that happens between this 16S, which is the small subunit ribosomal RNA, and the beginning of your messenger RNA, also known as the Shine Delgarno sequence. And again, these things are anti parallel relative to each other. So you have interaction through base pair interactions here with your small subunit. And then very close to that is the start site for translation. That AUG uh, codon, excuse me, which leads to association of your initiator tRNA. Again, in polycystronic transcripts where you're making multiple different proteins, you'll have stop codons and then a new ribosome binding site where you have, again, the small subunit which comes and associates and start and stop and start and stop. You go all the way down your transcript here. On the other hand, the monocystronic messenger RNAs that you have for most eukaryotic genes have an AUG site which is usually a couple hundred nucleotides away from the cap, but it turns out that the ribosome actually binds right at the five prime end and moves its way along until it gets to this particular start codon. Uh, this is also known as the five prime untranslated region or UTR. Um, and we'll talk about UTRs a lot more um, later on in the course. So we'll start out reviewing this bacterial transcriptional initi translational initiation, excuse me. Here again, we've got <coughs> our 16S ribosomal RNA right towards the three prime end of that, binds near to the five prime end of your messenger RNA, usually around eight to 10 nucleotides away from this AUG start codon. On the left-hand side of the slide, it's a slightly better image of what the small ribosomal subunit looks like. It comes together with your initiator tRNA and three initiation factors. These are translational initiation factors. And uh, you'll see this kind of terminology again and again and again in this course 
kind of alphabet soup, but I'll try and explain them as we go through each time. So these are all IFs, so initiation factors, that first step that you have in this whole process. So we have IF1, IF2, and IF3. You know, again, they didn't have much imagination when they named these things. But very often, the numbers that you have with these <coughs> relate to where they have eluded from column chromatography. So you remember we talked about column chromatography before. You isolate the individual fractions. You separate them by a ion exchange or gel filtration or something like that. The order that these things come off the column in is often how they end up getting named. So there's often no connection whatsoever between the activity and what that name is. But at least to give you some idea where those names actually came from in the first place. We'll see this is also important for the eukaryotic initiation factors for translation a little bit later on. All of those guys will have a little E in front of this IF or EF or RF as we get through. So <clears throat> these three initiation factors come together with your initiator tRNA and the small subunit of the ribosome, which of course is associated this way. You end up with the appropriate complex, then the large subunit, which again is sort of kind of looks like a hand. It's the blue in this figure comes down and associates with the small subunit with all of those initiation factors in the complex. So that's the process. Um, once you have this association, now the ribosome can do its job. So you don't need any of those initiation factors anymore. Those are dissociated, and now we have our initiation complex. Most critically, you'll notice that this you know, tRNA, of course, is still here. And the main reason it seems that you have to have the separation and putting stuff back together is that initiator tRNA can't get into this closed structure. The only way it can get in is if the large sum is not associated with small sum. So what's attached to that initiator tRNA in bacteria? It's a modified methionine just formulated at its end terminus. And that seems to be the way that the ribosome recognizes that, oh, this is the appropriate place to start. And it's also a mechanism that the cell can use to figure out that it's a proper protein. It's got a formal methionine at one end. That means, yes, it's been made properly. If it has, say, have a peptide that doesn't have that there, then there's been a problem with that protein somehow. So you have your formal methionines. These guys get um, attached. Once you have the assembly of this whole complex, and I just noticed a typo on this slide, um, you have GTP hydrolysis that takes place. So if you notice up here, IF2 is complex with GTP. Once you have assembly of the whole complex, basically that initiation factor senses that everything has been put together properly and at that point hydrolyzes GTP. And we talked about the GTP switches before. Hydrolysis of GTP causes a change in the structure of that protein. That change in structure of the protein, in the case of IF2, leads to dissociation of those other initiation factors and leaves the tRNA in the appropriate starting position. So this down here should be IF2GDP, not IF2GTP. It's another way of looking at this. Again, got to get the two subunits apart. Formal methionine together with your small subunit of the RNA. It's missing those initiation factors here. Initiation complex, once you have the small subunit and this tRNA together, then you can get the large subunit and get translation to take place. So that's bacterial translational initiation. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about eukaryotic translational initiation. And again, the big difference here is just that structure of the messenger RNA that we're looking at. It's not coming straight out of the RNA polymerase. It's been modified caps, tails, and splicing that have taken place on it. So this is the overview of that process. This is, in fact, from our textbook which does a horrible job talking about bacterial translational initiation, which is why I added those extra slides. Um, 
says, oh, basically it's the same. It's not quite the same. So there are those differences. Um, here you have your modified messenger RNA, cap, tail. One of the things that very often is the case in those five prime untranslated regions that you have in eukaryotic messenger RNA, you have secondary structures. And those are something you have to deal with as the ribosome is sort of moving along that chain. So you have assembly of all of your initiation factors on the RNA. And this is different from the bacterial case. The bacterial case, you have the small subunit that interacts directly with the RNA through the Schein-Galgarno sequence, the base pairing interaction. Here, you have all of these initiation factors which associate mostly with the cap structure. Once you have the cap structure, then you have the small subunit of the ribosome together with the initiator tRNA that gets assembled. You have also GTP hydrolysis. The large subunit comes in and you get extension. I'll talk about each of these steps in much more detail. There's a whole laundry list of different proteins that are involved here. I don't expect you to know all of them. Uh, but we'll talk about a few in a lot more detail. Again, these are IFs standing for initiation factors. And just the E in front of them is the eukaryotic initiation factor. EIF2 is probably the most important one here as far as the eukaryotic <coughs> translation. And fortunately, it does the same thing as IF2 in bacteria. Binds to this initiator tRNA, um, also is a GTP binding protein that has GTP ACE activity. So this is functioning in an extremely similar way. There are some other ones, and particularly the EIF fours, which are then very different relative to what you see in bacteria. AF4A is an RNA helicase, critical for getting those secondary structures taken off between the cap and where you actually are going to have your initiation codon. EIF4E is the cap binding protein. And so that was what brings all of these proteins together to that particular messenger RNA. And then EIF4G is the scaffold, the glue that really holds everything together. And we'll see one of the really important aspects of EIF4G is it also interacts with the poly-A binding protein, which is down at the three prime end of your messenger RNA. So it really sort of serves as a glue for everything together. And one of the most ridiculously confusing aspects of these eukaryotic initiation factors is this one down here, EIF4F. Again, it's because it's a fraction off of a column. That's what they called it. It's actually AF4A, 4E, and 4G together. So people talk about EF4F as that whole complex. Uh, and again, it wasn't my choice how we came about these things. So <clears throat> these are those eukaryotic initiation factors. And again, the ones that are really important as far as this class is concerned. What does it bind to? Well, what is it actually looking for? It's the start AUG. Well, unlike, again, the case in bacteria, we've got a nice shine Dargano sequence, and 8 to 10 nucleotides away, you've got an AUG. Here, this AUG can be you know, hundreds of nucleotides away from the cap structure. So how do you know that it's the right AUG and the right reading frame to start with? Because you start in the wrong reading frame, you've got completely wrong protein. So it's really critical that you find that appropriate AUG. Well, this was found by a number of researchers, but the most famous is Marilyn Kozak, who came up with this sequence here, which is called a consensus sequence. You haven't really talked about consensus sequences, but basically all that a consensus sequence is, is if you line up lots and lots of different sequences, in this case, where you start translation, you can find how often any individual nucleotide is used in any particular position. If it's the start codon, again, not terribly surprisingly, start codon is AUG encoding methionine. 100% of the time you'll have A, 100% of the time you'll have U, 100% of the time you'll have G. But 
very often at the position minus 3 relative to this, you'll have a purine residue, adenine or guanine. One downstream, you often are going to have guanine. And so it's not just the AUG in the case of eukaryotic starts. It's these extra nucleotides outside. So that's how the ribosome knows where to stop once it's been scanning through the nucleotides at the beginning of your messenger RNA. So that's breaking down that big figure we had before. First step, you have the association of EIF4F, which is these three components together, EIF4E, 4G, and 4A, with the cap structure. Once you have the association of these guys with the cap structure, that now can bind to the small subunit of the RNA together with the initiator tRNA associated with initiation factor 2 and GTP bound to it. So this whole complex associates here at the 5' prime end of your messenger RNA. Once it's associated, now it needs to find its way to the AUG. So that AUG, oh here it's a sub, <clears throat> initiator tRNA, again, you know, EIF2, cap structure EIF4E, and this whole complex association needs EIF4G, that AIF4G also associates with the poly A tail. Why is this so important? Well, you have to have these circular structures since once the ribosome is done translating your template into its protein, it dissociates. These two subunits come apart, large and small subunits. Well, they need to come back together to start translating again. And it's really to the cell's advantage if now the 3' prime end and the 5' prime end of your messenger RNA are close together. So you can have these ribosomes that, once they've dissociated, are able to reassociate on that same messenger RNA instead of diffusing away throughout the rest of the cell before they can find another one. So it's just keeping the 5' prime and the 3' prime end close to each other, which is why EIF4G is here. And you can even see these structures. These are what are called polysomes. Here's the cap structure with everything associated with it. And then these are messenger RNAs with ribosomes that are on them. So this is a structure you can actually see inside the cell. So on that structure, once you've bound everything here, in fact, 4G probably stays associated with the cap structure, not translocating along like this. But now the small subunit, together with particularly EIF4A, is going to scan along your messenger RNA until it gets to the AUG in that particular consensus sequence. The secondary structures in the UTR are taken out by particularly EIF4A, which is this RNA helicase. Once it finds the appropriate AUG structure, now you have hydrolysis of GTP by EIF2 to GDP. This is changing, of course, the structure of that initiation factor, causes, again, the dissociation of the other factors and the association of the large subunit of the ribosome. Once these are now associated, now this is a complex which is ready to continue into the elongation step. And basically, this is your initiation step. You've got everything together, your initiator tRNA in the middle of the ribosome. And this is when I want to bring up the three RNA, you say tRNA binding sites in the ribosome. There's the P site, the A site, and the E site. P is the peptidyl transferase site. That's where you actually have the activity of the ribosome. All again, RNA in the large subunit. The amino acyl site, that's where your new tRNAs are going to come down and bind. And then the exit site, which is where you're kicking out the tRNAs once you don't need them anymore. So here, broken down again, slightly different format. Here's our amino acyl tRNA comes down and binds in the A site. Once it's bound in the A site, then the ribosome catalyzes peptide bond formation. Then you have 
your first peptide bond, which is formed. So some people think about initiation as the initiator tRNA bound and everything together in the process. Some people talk about initiation as this first peptide bond, which is formed. So, and then beyond this is elongation. Quick aside, I wanted to talk about another way that you can get initiation to take place, which is a cap independent process. So you don't need EIF4E, because that's that cap binding protein. And it seems to be this is a secondary structure in your RNA, which can now bind to the appropriate initiation factors, such as EIF4G, that then allows assembly of your translational initiation process, again, in the absence of caps. And this is really nice because it allows you to have translation that happens from the middle of an RNA. And it turns out this is really critical for viruses, but you find them in a lot of cellular RNAs as well. So once you've got everything assembled, again, initiator tRNA at the right place, large and small subunits together. Sometimes, again, you'll have a tRNA in the A site. Now you can do your elongation process. So what happens in your elongation process, again, you've got your tRNA at the P site, an amino acyl tRNA at the A site. This binds. Now you have peptide bond formation. This peptide bond formation happens on the tRNA. And so anytime you're making a polypeptide chain, it's always covalently linked to the tRNA, that last tRNA, it's the C terminus of your polypeptide. These are always covalently linked to each other. So that's linked to your <clears throat> tRNA. Now I've got an empty E site a tRNA in the P site that doesn't have an amino acid attached to it, and the tRNA in the A site, which has our peptide attached to it. Now you have translocation, which is how you move the ribosome, basically clunking along three nucleotides at a time. And first you translocate the large subunit, then you translocate the small subunit, which happens here. Now we've got everything ready for the next round of addition of your amino acid. So it just, this just goes around and around and around till of course you get to the end. Now let's look at our friend GTPases, which are also involved in this process. Elongation, again, this is the process that we had right here. We've got now the tRNAs as these little L-shaped structures. The peptide is these purple beads coming off of the top. E site, P site, you have the amino acyl tRNAs, which will come down and bind here at the A site. Now, this is probably the most rate limiting step of translation because you have to form base pairs, according to those wobble rules that we already talked about, between the codon in the A site and the tRNA, the amino acyl tRNA, that's just floating around inside the cell. And the ribosome doesn't know what the codons are in your messenger RNA. So basically, it's just a sample all of the different tRNAs that you have inside the cell until it finds the right one. And how does it know that it's found the right one? Well, it's because the hydrogen bonds, normal base pairing interactions between the codon and anticodon, I should be switching my hands around, because of course they're in opposite orientations relative to each other. Once you have this proper structure that forms in those hydrogen bonds, then you need to say, oh, this is right. And how do you do that? Again, it's just like you have with the initiation factor two or EIF2. Appropriate confirmation, hydrolysis of GTP, and that then will release the tRNA in the A site. And will release it in such a way that now the tRNA can move inside the ribosome and bring its amino acid together with the extended chain on the tRNA in the P site. So now you have transpeptidation. Now we've had this first step. Then we have a second step which says, okay, 
We've made this, but now we need to move the ribosome. Moving takes energy. Where does that energy come from? Well, it comes again from our friend GTP. Now it's elongation factor G. So, oh, by the way, E here is the elongation factor. So elongation factor G binds to the ribosome. If we've had transpeptidation that's taken place, you have GTP hydrolysis, and basically it kicks the ribosome along, moves it one more space, and then you can go through this whole cycle again. This GTP binding protein up here in bacteria is called EFTU. Don't ask me why it's called EFTU, but that's your one that's bound to your amino acid tRNAs, checks to make sure you've got the right base pairing interactions. And then EFG is the translocation GTPase. These are much more conveniently in eukaryotes called elongation factor one and elongation factor two. And there are more than these, but these are the important ones. So how do these things work? We've actually solved crystal structures for most of these proteins. Um, EFG and EFTU, again, are GTP binding proteins. And what they seem to do is actually perform these you know, really pretty amazing structural changes on GTP hydrolysis. So here we have GTP bound, and I have those in quotes because it's actually a modified form of GTP um, because if you just put in GTP, it's going to be hydrolyzed. So this is the structure that we think EFTU looks like with GTP bound, and you see this big change as soon as you have the, that change in GTP going to GDP. The other thing which happens with this change in structure, which is probably most important, not so much that EFTU, that's just saying, okay, we've got the right base pairing interaction, now make this peptide bond formation. EFG has to kick the ribosome along. Well, how does it do that? Well, basically, what it does is it mimics a tRNA bound to this EFTU. So here on this side, we have EFG, which should look really similar to EFTU GTP. So this EFG looks like a tRNA coming into here. Once you have hydrolysis, that then will change the structure. It doesn't look like a tRNA anymore. And so now you move through this whole process. This is a mechanism called molecular mimicry. Um, we'll see it all the time. Um, proteins looking like nucleic acids and nucleic acids looking like proteins. And so here it's a nice example, again, of EFG looks a lot like this amino acid here, EFTU, together with the tRNA. How do we have elongation taking place? This is just the case from our textbook. Exactly the same thing. We have now the eukaryotic elongation factors, which will come down and bind. If it's correct, you have GTP hydrolysis. Then you'll have translocation with EF2. This goes relatively slowly. And another thing I didn't put on here, you'll notice we've got a lot of GTP hydrolysis that's going on. So translation is an incredibly energy dependent process. Probably most of the energy inside the cell is being used for translation. Because you've got to use ATP to amino acylate all of your tRNAs. Then you have to have all of this GTP hydrolysis checking to make sure at every step, every amino acid which is getting added, basically you're hydrolyzing two GTPs. That amino acid being made in amino acylate is an ATP. So you've got three hydrolyses that are going on for any single amino acid which is actually getting added. So it's a very energy dependent process. So that's elongation. Okay, you get to the end. What do you do now? Now you have to terminate. This is unfortunately not the TFs, which is what you would call them here. And for termination, now they're called release factors. Uh, the release factor in bacteria, um, here it's got a blob structure. It actually, again, looks a lot like a tRNA. We'll see that on the next slide. 
but you have association with these release factors. Now we have stop codons. Now this can't interact with any of those amino acyl tRNAs. And so probably what happens with the ribosome just associates with all of your different tRNAs that are there, slightly more than 20, but nothing binds. And so nothing binds there. You don't have GTP hydrolysis by EFTU until you have this release factor that binds. And that release factor binds quite well. And now what it does, it just tricks the ribosome into trying to make a peptide bond to it. Well, there's no amino acid hooked up, no amino acyl tRNA uh, at this position. And so basically, the peptide bond is formed to water. And now your peptide is released. Well, that's great and wonderful, except now your ribosome has a tRNA in the middle of it, the P site, that doesn't have a peptide attached to it anymore. And then this protein sitting at the A site. Now what you need to do is move this whole thing apart, basically break the whole ribosome into the two pieces so it can recycle and go back and start itself again. So that process also depends on a <clears throat> GTP hydrolysis. It's this release factor. Comes together, you have GTP hydrolysis, changes the structure of this protein. Once that structure is changed, it no longer is going to interact in the A site. And now we have an empty ribosome, which then gets dissociated by other release factors. But the important thing here is our RF2 binds, RF3 comes in and basically bumps it out. Again, through GTP hydrolysis. This is that molecular mimicry, which I was telling you about here. RF2 in yellow binds to this empty A site, because again, the stop codon, there's no tRNA which can bind there, and convinces the ribosome to try and make a peptide bond to it, but there's no amino acid to go to, and so that is actually released. So another way of looking at that, these are now the eukaryotic release factors that function in an extremely similar way to the bacterial release factors. Here again, the release factor comes in, it's bound to GTP. First thing that happens, peptide bond to water, hydrolysis of GTP to GDP, that causes dissociation of your large and small subunits, which can then go to the five prime end of your RNA, bind to it, and start <clears throat> your uh, translation next round again. This is great if you happen to have a stop codon. But <laughs> RNA, probably why it's not used as genetic material, is pretty unstable. So quite often, you'll have a messenger RNA that has a break in the middle of it, and you don't get to a stop codon. So the ribosome gets to the end of your messenger RNA, and it gets stuck. And this is a big problem, because you need those ribosomes to make all your proteins with. So there are a number of different ways of dealing with this, but probably the best understood of them is this process called cMRNA. This is a bacterial process. There's a different process in eukaryotes that, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about. Uh, but this tMRNA is exactly like what it sounds. It's a combination between a tRNA and a messenger RNA. And what it does is it comes down, binds in the A site of a stalled ribosome. And stalled here because it's gotten to the end of the messenger RNA. Can't do anything more. So this tMRNA comes down and binds in the A site, gives you an amino acid to bind to. In this case, it's an alanine. And then you have transpeptidation that takes place. But now what happens is this tRNA also has an mRNA-like segment right in the middle of it. And so basically, this comes in and displaces the messenger RNA, causing translation to take place off of this little sequence right here. And this little sequence here leads to the end. There's a nice little termination codon right at the end here. You release your protein, now with this extra tag at the end of it. And that extra tag comes from the sequence, which is encoded right here in your tMRNA. 
and I like to think of this as the eat me tag. Uh, basically because if you have a protein being made from a messenger RNA that stops in the middle, it's probably not a good protein. You don't want to have that around. So this coding sequence here in your tmRNA, that mRNA part of your tmRNA, leads to a tag at the end of your protein which says, this is a bad protein, get it degraded. So these are translation, translational initiation factors. I talked about particularly IF2. It's just a list of all of them. Elongation factors, EFTU and EFG are the important ones. The release factors in bacteria, there are three of them. RF1 and RF2 just recognize different termination codons, and RF3 is the one that comes through and recycles that. In eukaryotes, the laundry list is a lot longer. I don't expect you to remember all of them. Just these important ones like EIF2, EIF4E, cat binding, EIF4G, which is that bridging process between the three prime N and the five prime N, holding your messenger RNA together. The elongation factors, EF1 and EF2, again, basically identical to EFTU and EFG. And then the release factors, conveniently in eukaryotes, you only have two of them. Release factor one recognizes all three different termination codons and release factor three then is that GTP ACE which will take that structure and pop it all out. Last thing to talk about today are antibiotics. Why antibiotics? Who cares about antibiotics? Well, it turns out that almost all antibiotics that are used today address translation or superquent. So if you just look at these, again, it's not critical exactly which one of these does what. Tetracycline, amino acyl tRNA to the A site. Streptomycin, stops translation initiation to chain elongation. Chloramphenicol, blocks peptidyl transferase. So these are all antibiotics that are directed at translation. Translation, again, absolutely critical. If you don't have translation, you're not going to be making proteins. Burns a lot of energy inside the cell. So not surprisingly, these are all things which are acting on translation as a process. I also talked about the ribosomes being different relative to each other, bacterial ribosomes versus eukaryotic ribosomes. What that means is these chemicals, the antibiotics, are usually very specific for bacteria versus eukaryotes. So now if you go down and look at the bottom here, cyclohexamide is a really good chemical for blocking translocation on eukaryotic ribosomes, but it does nothing to bacteria. Same thing is true for <clears throat> acinomycin, blocks peptidyl transferase on ribosomes just in eukaryotic cells. And so it's these differences in ribosomes that we can actually take advantage of for medical processes. So the next four minutes I'll talk about replication. <clears throat> 